is this working? I guess. Is it? Yeah. Good morning. So um, I'm going to be talking about simulation of RMI in the presence of thermal fluctuations using uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics. And thanks to the first speaker who gave a pretty nice introduction to RMI, so uh, it saves me a lot of time. Um, so this is also, I'm from KAUST, from the Fluids and Plasma Simulation Lab, and I work with Ravi Santane. Uh, we are classically a, I mean, traditionally, we've been a fluids, fluid dynamics group. So this is sort of a first venture into anything that's stochastic. And so this talk, I had to pick an audience to direct it at, so I'm going to pick a CFD audience. Uh, I, under I understand there's people from the stochastic community as well in this conference, and some of the details might be mundane to you. And for that, I apologize. So the reason to include thermal fluctuations into your usual macro scale deterministic system is that they do become significant in small volumes. So if you look at the relative magnitude of the density fluctuations, for example, in, a, in this hard sphere model, then they scale as one by the, the volume. And so one example of this, one illustration of it rather is a molecular dynamic simulation where it's a nanoscale channel, uh, and then if you look at the fluid center of mass under the imposition of uh, a forcing, they follow like a stochastic trajectory. And if you look at the uh, PDF of the center of masses, they're actually Gaussian. The other, the other uh, ex situation is a, uh, under microgravity. So they, this is an experiment they did in space. And then say they took a mixture of two solutions, toluene and polystyrene, and then when they imposed a temperature gradient, they saw that there were these huge fluctuations uh, correlated in space and time that were developing. And this is about four millimeter by four millimeter and then one, one, one 1.5 mm thick. So they are actually large in, in magnitude. So, and then the other stipulation is that thermal fluctuations might play a key role in triggering instability. So you want to capture, if you're studying onset in super detail, then you want to capture these. So this is the initial condition, a, a, a CFD result, an MD result, which captures these perturbations, and then a fluctuating hydrodynamics result, which does exactly the same. Just to show that you know, if you include fluctuations in your hydrodynamic model, you're able to do this. So that said, the overarching goal for me was to uh, this work was to develop a two fluid uh, model and the numerical methods had to be developed from scratch and then we wanted a code uh, which had a equation of state hook because we wanted to do this for liquids. Uh, the objectives for this particular talk would be uh, for this set of work is to verify the equilibrium solution and then use it for RMI simulations and then can we say something about what happens to the post shock growth rate uh, in the presence of thermal fluctuations. Uh, the governing equations, uh, we have our classic compressible Navier-Stokes uh, with the deterministic terms, and then there's a divergence of a stochastic flux on the right-hand side, which models thermal fluctuations. Uh, so we want to extend our traditional CFD methods to stochastic systems. This is a divergence of a noise. It's not a noise which is external by itself. Uh, so we, we're not using collocation methods and so on. So. Uh, the equations look like this. This is your solution vector with the uh, two fluid. That's the other species there. And then your advective terms, a diffusion term. And then there's a stochastic term. These S and Qs are st uh, stochastic stress and heat, ve heat vectors, OK? We'll talk more about these later. The uh, closure for the uh, mean values is this. And then the fluctuating terms themselves, the magnitudes are given by these, where these Ns are basically your noise terms. And we look at how we set these magnitudes. But that's what the governing equation looks like. So uh, a little bit more about the noise term. So uh, how can we understand this better? I mean, is it even uh, based on some sort of solid theory? Yes. So one answer, which is also true for nonlinear fluctuations around a mean value, is given by coarse graining microscopic dynamics. And then you will see if you go, if you crank through it, that you can get the magnitude of the noise as well as the form of the governing equations, which turns out to be exactly similar. Now, I have the details of this in my backup slides, and if anybody wants to go into it, we can. The easy explanation, which to illustrate is valid for linear fluctuations, is Landau's, Landau's framework, which I'll just quickly show here. So uh, what 
so if you take a single fluid, then your dissipation function is always a conjugate, uh, a dissipative force, a dissipative flux times a force conjugate contractions of these. So then uh, we have our Q and then the temperature gradient and shear stress and then uh, grad U. So Landau's postulate was, it was completely intuitive at that time, which was later proved that dissipative fluxes are macroscopic manifestations of the microscopic degrees of freedom and therefore they have to be made fluctuating quantities. Uh, so then if you have our J as the fluxes here, you basically say everything is equal to a mean part plus, plus a fluctuating term. In this presentation, my delta tau and delta Q are no denoted by uh, S and Q respectively. So that was the key contribution of Landau's framework, which works for linear fluctuations. And how do we get the exact form of noise, which is something people here might be familiar with. There are uh, FDTs for this sort of thing. So, uh, so basically what that says is a physical way of uh, coming into peace with this is that if you have any uh, thermodynamic flux, which is a mean plus a fluctuating part, then this is your standard phenomenological coefficient based relation, which says how non-small disturbances relax and then uh, random math theory will give you this correlation function. And so what the FDT says is, it, it says these, the regression of this is related to these guys. So physical meaning, of course, Onsage's statement gives that, that the regression of the microscopic thermal fluctuations at equilibrium follows the macroscopic law of relaxation of small non-equilibrium disturbances. So preservation of this thing is kind of important when you design numerical methods. Um, Okay, this is again just exactly an illustration of how we come up with our equations. So you can, uh, we know Fourier's law of heat conduction and then the constitutive model for a neutron in fluid. So you can crank out your M alpha betas and so you can get your exact form of the noise where these Zs, like we saw, actually absorb these uh, noise fields here. So um, again, this was aimed at a CFD community. So if you recall, these were the noise terms and there was a typo on the previous slide. Yeah, okay. Uh, so a Brownian motion is, uh, if, if you're gonna look at how to, I'm gonna have a one slide about how to go about discretizing Brownian motion. So it has probably the zero, uh, probability of uh, one at t equal to zero and then increments are basically independent from each other, right? So if we had a function of a noise, which was something like that, then you would have to discretize your time in increments where each increment is given by that, where this is the uh, Gaussian noise. And then so you will have several instances uh, and then the average would of course give you the expected value of the function. Um, <coughs> why we were looking into that? Because now in addition to your disc space discretization, uh, you also have to discretize the noise. So, uh, so 1D results uh, for a single fluid and we, will, we'll, we were looking at equilibrium problems. So mean flow is zero. Um, we started with the fourth order method for reasons uh, we thought we'd get better s spectrum across mid-wave numbers. So we, uh, this, so we have our, uh, after method of lines discretization, we have this thing, uh, the numerical fluxes, we used fourth order methods. And if you take just the uh, divergence of the stochastic flux, it, the term looks like this. And uh, this, where this uh, cell-centered stochastic stress and heat flux looks like that, where this is your incremental, uh, the, the, incre the noise term here that goes into it. So when we looked at the fluctuation spectrum for zero mean flow and uh, we uh, normalized them by the theoretical values and we were looking at the, whoa. Okay, this, this happened from, this was a Mac from Windows thing. So basically these are uh, squared errors from the, um, and the x-axis is gone as well, okay. Squared errors from the, uh, what's ex for the, from the, from the theoretical values. So this is the uh, row u, this is the row row, and then this is the u u. Um, so we were doing, and all the y value, all the values are gone, damn. Um, Okay, basically th this was like 5%, that's, that's I think comparable to this. These two are comparable, it's a shame. Um, so, I mean, doing in the density fluctuation being within 15% is considered okay. So we were, we were sort of convinced that our uh, method was validated. I'm, I'm verified, sorry. So we looked at weak convergence with respect to expected values of the structure factors 
this sucks. Um, sorry. There's nothing I can do. Um, okay, so uh, th these are the uh, first order and second order slopes, and we have for a few different delta t's, which are like one picosecond and so on, which are really small. And then what we found was that there was no gain with respect to weak convergence from the higher order method. Um, which was sort of obvious because, I mean, once you add stochasticity in, your order of accuracy is going to drop down. And I hope that doesn't happen to the other plots. Um, so then we, we moved on to RMI simulations for the two fluid case. And uh, we decided to drop our accuracies down to save compute time. So uh, we just decided to go with second order methods. And then your uh, cell-centered, again, cell-centered stochastic stress and heat flux looks like that. So OK, so all my data values are, axis values are gone. Um, so we, we decided to uh, first verify our code for the non-fluctuating case against experimental values. and. Uh, so we picked up this experiment from uh, Air SF6 case. We matched the domain size, the uh, wavelength, the amplitude of the perturbation, everything one on one, even the location of the shock and the interface. And uh, so we, we looked at uh, that's the simulation. The red line is the experiment. And this is the interface location. And then the uh, non dimensionalized uh, evolution of the amplitude. And this is just a simulation results of the growth rate, which is which is uh, sort of standard to the linear theory that the first speaker just said. And then qualitatively, we can see time-wise, there's a pretty good match in terms of features. And this is green because the density value is not rescaled to show it, show it as red in the simulations. But otherwise, everything was pretty nice. So we were pretty happy with our deterministic code. With the stochastic code, thank god the axis is visible here. Um, with, this, uh, with, the, uh, with fluctuations turned on, then we picked up a problem which was smaller uh, so that we, we thought there would be some sort of business, uh, some sort of rational or reason or effect produced from in including thermal fluctuations. So we, we picked up a problem from this paper where they used DSMC to study RMI. Uh, and so we, again, matched the system dimensions and the Mach numbers and locations of shocks and so on. And then we were, of course, we couldn't match the perturbation uh, amplitude exactly, because they set up their perturbations in a different way. And we saw this was their DSMC result. And we are, so we are, we are pretty happy with, with and without fluctuation. The fluctuations at this scale are not supposed to have an effect, actually. You have to go to like really, you have to go to like one micron sized dimensions to see an effect. Um, again, so with, with the amplitude as well, we are doing fine. Uh, we would do finer if we matched their A naught exactly. So, and then uh, we see that the ensemble average fluctuating result is pretty close to uh, the, uh, the deterministic result, which is what is expected. So at least we have done things right in terms of including fluctuations into the model. Now, so the future work, I mean, I had some results but there was, so what we did is we shrank the size of the channel to a micron. And uh, so we are seeing some effects of the fluctuations. But I, I, I just basically took the slides out because uh, we want to make sure what we are seeing is OK. And then so what happens is uh, the shock gets slowed down. And so the interaction, the growth, I mean, the interaction between the shock and the interface starts at a slightly later time. And, and then the growth also changes. And we want to make sure that that's actually a solid result because it's sort of new. And then we don't want to be putting something on there which is not, which doesn't, it's not, it's not at least properly explained. So that's why we stand. And uh, I acknowledge the Chaos Supercomputing Colab. And then thank you.
we, we didn't because the fluctuations coming from, so they did the DSMC uh, study because they wanted to show that DSMC can be used for RMI and then it gives the same universal behavior. Yeah. The fluctuations arising in the DSMC solution is because of statistical noise. So it's not, yeah, it's, it, it doesn't make sense to compare it, yeah. Had they sampled more, which they were limited by computing time, they would have gotten it down, yeah. Back to the uh, comparison with uh, Yakov's uh, yes, this one. Could you explain? Uh, there seems to me uh, uh, not not small difference, but uh, some huge of the difference of the shape. Of the shape, yes, of course. So if we that's some people have done like say ninth order uh, compact difference and so on, you'll get a better feature-based comparison. So of course, I mean this. This was a, this is a fourth order, and then if you dial down it to second order, it becomes. I mean the the resolution of the features obviously. I mean the quality of the features goes down. So that's just up. If you use a high order method, you can definitely get good features. But we were just looking for val verification of these quantitatives, mm -hmm. because once we we not chasing features per se. We want to, you know, build an FHD code. So. Thanks again.